Hello everyone. Today we're going to be starting on section 1.8, Introduction to Linear Transformations. Specifically, the focus would be on matrix transformations. The topics I'll be covering are will be a recap of matrix equations and functions and then we will focus on matrix transformations. So let's begin with a span of a set of vectors. If we have V1 to Vp, some vectors in n-dimensional space, then the set of all linear combinations of V1 to Vp is called the span of V1 to Vp. And the span is also called the subset of Rn, which is spanned by the set of vectors V1 to Vp. Another way, the span of V1 to Vp it is a collection of all vectors, which can be written in the form of C1V1 plus C2V2 plus dot 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 CPVP, and the Cis are all scalars. Now let's look at matrix equation and a vector equation. Remember vector equation is the set of vectors a1, a, n and b in R, m, suppose it's an m-dimensional space, such that the vector b can be written as a linear combination of the vectors a1 to a, n. So x1, a1 plus x2, a2 dot 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 plus x and a, n equals b. So this equation is actually a vector equation. Now we have learned also that every vector equation can be written as a matrix equation where the vectors a1 to an are now going to be forming the columns of the matrix A and this equation 1, the vector equation, can be written as ax equals b where the matrix A is a m by n matrix and having columns a1 to a n. Now let's look at the definition of a function, a very simplistic definition we have been doing for so, so long, guys. So what's a function? A function is a rule that assigns to each element of the set A a unique element of the set B. Graphically, you can think of these two sets as A and B, and a function is a rule which will assign an element x of a an element f of x of b. Now some terminology. The whole set a is called the domain of the function. The whole set b is called the codomain of the function f. And now, not every element of B may have an element in X. So in that scenario, we're going to look at the range of F. Now, the range of F, suppose let me create the function again. So this A, according to the definition, every element of A is going to have a connection here in B. But the range of f means all those elements, suppose this little red one, are the elements which are all connected to the whole, have every element here in this red has an element in A, V R F. So this is called the range of f. So it simply means it is a set of all those elements in B that have an element, say, x in A. Remember, very important, that when we say a word function, function simply means every element of A has to be used. Every element here. Every element of A is going to have an element in B. But every element of B may or may not have an element in X uh, of A, um, uh, an X with which is an element of A. So you have to be very careful of that. 
rule of function, every element of A has to be having something in B. And every element of B may not have elements of A. For example, let me create a nice little example here for you. So if I have a set A, say I have one, two, three, and I have a set A here, say I have loads, smiley faces, okay, a smiley face, oh, it's not becoming a smiley face. Oh, okay, so let's make one nice little, okay, okay. Uh, so let's be with the conventions here now. Okay, uh, I have a star here and I have, okay, I'll make my little smiley face and then I have, say, an element um, K, okay? Now, one, as it's a function, so I have a function here. Now, one goes to star and three also goes to star as a function and two goes to the smiley face. But k has nowhere to go. It's a function, guys. Okay. Now, we have learned about matrix equations and functions. So now let's go to the main part of this session, which is linear transformations and specifically matrix transformations. Okay. We're going to consider two matrix equations. Ax equals b. So... We're going to look at Ax equals B, and a matrix equation, Au equals 0. Okay, the matrix A, guys, is the same. Okay, so this matrix A is the same in both of these matrix equations. The vector x here is all 1s, and the vector u is 1, 4, minus 1, and 3. So when we do the matrix equation, A with X, we get 5 and 8. And when you multiply A with U, we get a 0 vector. So that's matrix equation, sample matrix product, and we get a vector. But now we're going to focus it on from a very different angle. Instead of looking at it from a matrix point of view, we're going to look at it from vectors. And our focus would be on the vector X, B, U, and 0. So those are the ones which play a major role here. Okay, let's look at that in, in more deeper. So this vector X is an element of R4. And the vector B is an element of R2. So notice what is happening is when A is multiplied to a vector in R4, it takes us to a vector in R2. Okay, so we, now instead of looking at as a matrix, I'm looking at as a, you know, of a matrix when acting upon an element in R4 going to an element in R2. So now this whole matrix equation can be thought of in terms of sets r4 and r square and how the matrix multiplication is done is by defined by that relationship so here are my x suppose this is my x okay so what does x do so when it has to be acted upon by a so when x is acted upon by a matrix it's a multiplication by a so when x is acted upon by a so a is like acting upon x it gives us a new vector Ax, which is B in R2. Now, that was only one vector in R4. Suppose there's another vector U. You know, there are many vectors in R4. So I have a vector now U also in R4. And the same matrix, when acts upon U, takes us to the zero vector. So what we're seeing is a rule which takes elements from R4 going to elements in R2. So now a matrix multiplication by a matrix is actually like you're having a transformation or a mapping here. So what we notice is, so we having a, a transformation or a mapping. So suppose I have a mapping F here at this point. 
So I have a mapping f from r4 to r square. And how is this mapping defined? This f of x, where x is an element r4, takes us to an element in r square, which is given by ax. So now the same matrix equation is being looked as a mapping from a set r4 to a set r2. Okay, so uh, in the next slide, you see all the things I talked about previously. So the multiplication of a vector is basically looked upon as a transformation from one set to another set. So let's look at these observations. When you look at the matrix product AX and AU, it is the action of the matrix A on vectors X and U, which produces vectors B and 0. So it's basically like finding all vectors in R4. This matrix equation is like finding all vectors in R4 to be transformed to vectors in R squared under the action of the multiplication of A. Very important. It's a very specific way that elements in R4 are going to elements in R2. So this relationship between vectors in R4 and R2 is a function from one set of vectors to another set of vectors. So this one things we have talked about, so F a mapping from A to B can be thought of F is a mapping from R4 to R squared. So let's give a proper formal definition. A transformation. Okay, so now transformation is, is a function or a mapping. So we are used to the word function or mapping, but in the matrix world, we use the word transformations. A transformation from n dimensional space to m dimensional space is a rule which assigns to each vector x in Rn a vector t of x in Rn. So let's create a little graph. So I have a vectors in Rn and I have a vector in Rn. I'm just taking a very general uh, you know, um, dimensional spaces. So a transformation takes vectors in Rn and we're just going to denote it by the capital T and takes it to an element in Rm, which is given by T of x. As we just talked about what, uh, you know, the domains and codomains in a function, the same thing will happen here to the transformations. Now the set Rn is called the domain of T, and the Rm, that is the m-dimensional space, is called the codomain of T. Also, the notation Rn to Rm indicates that the domain of T is Rn and the codomain is Rm. Now, there's a terminology called the image of x. So, when you see every vector x in Rn, this vector Tx is called the image of x under the action of T. Very important, guys. This statement is a very important statement. It's like the same thing we have been learning again and again, but I'm just giving a new way of looking at it. That means the vector Tx is nothing but the image of x under the action of the transformation T. And we, when we put all these images together, the set of Tx, it is called the range of T. So we can look at it as in the next slide graphically. Remember, a transformation is a function, it is a mapping. Um, so when you look at this one, so according to the definition of a function, every element in the domain has to be used. So that's why this whole green color means every element. And when T, this transformation acts on Rn via that matrix multiplication for us, it is going to take us to a new element. So remember the green part is where the range is. The codomain is every element of Rn. Okay, what is a matrix transformation? So we, I use the example of guys, remember the matrices to talk about transformations. So the way we created our 
transformations was via matrix multiplication. So we're going to give it a, a title or we call it a matrix transformation. Okay, so a matrix transformation is a transformation given by T from n dimensional space to m dimensional space defined by tx equals ax where a is a m by n matrix and x is a vector in rn now notice this the size and the dimensional spaces have a very deep connection the size of the matrix is what m by n now n the columns are actually coming from the dimensional space of the domain of T. Whereas the number of rows of this matrix A is coming from the dimensional space of the co-domain of T. This one, this one. Okay, now to make our life simpler, we can write this as, whenever you see the symbol, X goes to AX, Simply, it is a matrix transformation. Um, I would, guys, actually use the proper definition so that I'm much more clearer. I would always write like this as it makes more sense to me. If you are more comfortable with this notation, you're more than welcome, but I'll be basically using this, the proper definition of a matrix transformation. Okay, some obs observations. Matrix multiplication is associated with transformations or what we call functions or mappings. But remember, in the matrix world, the transformation is the word used. Okay, for each x in Rn, T of x is computed as a matrix multiplying a vector. The domain of T is Rn and what we just talked about when you have this matrix transformation that the columns of the domain of T and the columns of number of columns of A has a connection. Similarly, the codomain of T is Rm when each column of A has M entries. Now, what is the meaning of range of T? Now, remember Ax. If you remember the matrix Ax is a vector, suppose Ax equals B. And if you write it as a vector equation, so it is A1x1 plus A2x2 dot dot dot, Anxn equals B, then the range of T is nothing but the set of all linear combinations of the columns of A, where A1 up to An are the columns of A. Okay, we've done a lot of theory now. Let's do some examples and make connections. The first example, if A is a six by five matrix, okay, you have a six by five matrix. So, and this is corresponding to a transformation. We like to know what are these dimensional spaces? So what would be A here? A would be what? Remember, the domain of T is related to the number of columns. So A is 5. And the codomain of T is related to the number of rows. So here, my A is 5 and B is 6. Okay, next question. How many rows and columns must a matrix have in order to define a mapping from R4 into R5. So what this implies, T is a matrix from R4 to R5 and it is a transformation, matrix transformation given by Tx equals Ax. So we'd like to know what is the size of this matrix A which corresponds to this transformation. This one, remember, once again, M is 5. It's 5 and then 4, the domain of your transformation is the, equal, is the domain, is the one which is having when A has n columns. That means 5 by 4. Okay. Huh. 
Okay, now let's look at another example. Now we are given a matrix A and sub vectors U, B, and C. We are defining a transformation T from R2 to R3 by this matrix. Uh, a multiplication where Tx equals Ax. So that basically this transformation is a matrix transformation. And x is a vector in R2. So the questions we would be looking at is, what is T of x? That means when T acts on any arbitrary element in R2, what would it look like as an element in R3? Then if I give a specific vector u in a in this R2, what would be the image of u under the transformation du? Another question, if I have an element x in R2, oh sorry, we would like to find an x in R2 whose image under t is p. In other words, so remember this t is R2 to R3. We have an element b here. We would like to know is there an x or we would like to find an x which is related to this b. The question is, is there one x or is there more than one x? And then determine if the c is in the range of the transformation t. Now this one is asking, is there is a possibility? Remember this c is over here in R3. Determine, in other words, if it is in the range, the question is, is there an x by when t acts upon it it will take us to c now the second uh, the third question here is find an x that means yes that's basically saying there is an x on the other hand the last question says do you think that c is in the range of transformation of t that means do you think there is an x in the domain of t such that when t acts upon it it will take us to c similar kind of problems, but a different approach to it. Okay, let's start with t of x. Now find t of x. In other words, remember t is the mapping from r squared to r3 and this t, tx simply says, how does when x is any element in r2 and when a acts upon this x, what does my vector looks like? So it's a simple matrix multiplication and this is the vector we get. Remember A is a matrix of size 3 by 2 and the vector x is a 2 by 1. That means the new vector which we get in R3 should be a 3 by 1. And I hope so guys you are becoming more comfortable in doing matrix product. Okay. Now let's look at this find t of u. In other words, we're giving a very specific vector u. And, and we would like to find the image of u under the transformation t. So if you look at it from a nice little graph point, so my vector u is in R2. Okay. I would like to know when t acts upon it, what does my t u look like in R3? So basically, replace x by the vector u and just again do a matrix product and you get the vector to be 5, 1, minus 9. Okay, now, now let's look at the next question. It says find an x in R2 whose image under T is P. Notice guys, what I'm doing is whenever I have questions like this, I try to visualize it because it makes more sense to me. So if that helps you, please go ahead and do it too. So in this one, I'm saying, okay, I have a transformation. I know T is a transformation from R squared to R cube and Tx is Ax. That's what I know. And when I look at from the graph point of here, so this is my r squared, this is my r3, and I'm a given a vector, and I know this is a vector now. What are we given is a vector b. We would like to know, find an x in r2. In other words, I would like to find this vector x 
in R2 such that when T acts upon it, that T of X will give me the vector B. In other words, T of X, remember, is what? AX equal to B, which takes back to once again the section 1, 2. In other words, solve this matrix equation. Give me the vector X. And what does that simply mean? amounts to? Up, row reduce the augment matrix. Okay, so let's do all that row reduction algorithm. Now you have, remember, Tx is Ax, just write it down. Now remember, this is A, this is X, this is B, and when you write down the augment matrix, so how is the augment matrix guy going to look like? A and B. Okay, I have done all the detailed work for you guys and uh, these notes are also posted, um, the PDF files are also posted for you, so um, just go over that. Uh, the first one, remember, I'll just explain a little bit over here and then uh, I will let you guys work the rest. Remember, when you do row reducing the augment matrix is Basically, as remember, this augment matrix means this is the, um, you know, the last column is the vector B. Remember, this is the vector B and this is the matrix A. So we have to write down the matrix A because when you're row reducing, in other words, this matrix A should be written as the columns of the identity matrix. Now, the first thing is we start with looking at the topmost column. Uh, the topmost row in the leftmost column. And if this is a non-zero element, that means that is my pivot. And now you make the two values beneath this to be zero. We apply these two row operations. We get this new matrix. Now we have to do, write continue. And then we look at the, uh, once the first, uh, the, we have done that part, then we go to the next non-zero row. And that's next non-zero row is the second row. And that becomes and we look at the column which comes after that. That is now this is the next pivot column, and that means the pivot is number 14. And then what I do is I want to make my life simple, so I basically multiply it by 1 over 14 and get it the value 1. Remember, because I'm looking for columns of the identity matrix. So the first column already is the first column of the identity matrix. I have to make this to be the second column of the identity matrix. That means top and below should be 0, 2. And the element uh, of the second row, this uh, second column, should be a 1. Okay, so once I made that 1, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this to be 0 and this to be 0. Uh, this is done in two steps. Once you do these two steps, what you see is, so I go from here to here, guys. That's where we go. And then this is the final step. You see, this is the two columns of the identity matrix. And this automatically says when x1 is 1.5 and x2 is negative 0.5, for this vector x here, when t acts upon it, it takes us to the vector b, which is given. So, and notice that this is the only it's a unique solution, okay? And, and as it is a unique solution, that means there is only one vector x which will go to the vector b. And that's the answer to the next question. It says, is there more than one x whose image under t is b? No. When you look backwards, there's only one vector x. Now, so, there's only one x whose image is b. Okay. So in, in other words, what you're saying is that this is a unique solution. Now let's look at the last question. The last question says, determine if c is in the range of transformations. Now remember what the range means. I have two matrices, um, you know, sorry, two dimensional spaces, r squared, r3. As t is a transformation, everything will be going here. The range is all those values in this little green, you know, filled triangle here, which basically 
has elements here in the whole of R2. The ones which are not, we do not have any uh, elements in R2. So the question is, determine if C. In other words, is C, what I'm simply saying is, is C in this little, is in the range of T. This little range of T, guys, is this little triangle, filled triangle, right angle triangle, kind of, okay? Okay, what is this another way of saying? Is the system consistent? That's what it means. Okay, once again, we row reduce the matrix. When you row reduce the matrix, and I guys will let you enjoy and do the work on your own. And when we do this, so this is where the matrix started, and in the end, we are here. Notice what we see. I see the presence of a row with the last column of the augment matrix becomes the pivot column. Oh, sorry, when the last column of the augment matrix becomes the pivot column, or the last row of this augment matrix is not satisfying theorem 2. And that basically shows that the system is inconsistent. So, which implies C is not in the range of T. Okay, now I'm going to take some examples from the book, basically some section questions. It says, find all x in R4 that are mapped onto the z into the zero vector by this transformation. Now, guys, it's not telling us where this mapping, this matrix transformation is going from what dimensional space to what. It's simply saying it's giving us the domain. Okay, so what basically this is doing is, it says, I have a matrix T from R4 to some dimensional space, I do not know what dimensional space, say Rm, and what this is saying is I want all the vectors here, okay, in R4. So suppose this green is all those vectors in R4 and my R4 is this, you know, the red little, trying to make a circle doesn't bake. It says all those elements in R4 which are now going to, now suppose this is Rm, okay, this is Rm, and there is a zero vector. Remember, it is an n-dimensional space, and this zero vector will have m rows to be zero. So this zero vector is this, 0, 0, dot, 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 0, and they are m of them, okay. So what this question is saying, find all the x's in R4 which are mapped into the zero vector by this matrix transformation. Remember, this is the notation for matrix transformation for the given matrix A. So in other words, all this thing in this little green in R4, we like to know what are those things in this R4, in this little green thing in R4, that little vectors. Now, there can be one vector or there can be many vectors. We do not know at this point. But let's look at this equation. Tx equal to Ax equal to 0. Notice, we're trying to find all the solutions of this homogeneous equation. Remember, everything is connecting, guys. We, I'll keep on going back and to the things we have done earlier. So make sure that you are, you know, practicing all the concepts which has been done before the section 1.8. Okay, so let's come back to this. Now, so this Tx is Ax equals 0. Now, in other words, this, I don't even need to, when I write down the row reduce this matrix, I don't have to write down a bunch of zeros. That is because the homogeneous equation, the last column, doesn't even give any answer because that is just a bunch of zeros. So my coefficient matrix and the, you know, this basically is the matrix here A and then last bunch of zeros. It's the augment matrix you're looking at. 
So this matrix and this matrix are basically the same because if I apply the row operations, this is still going to be a bunch of zeros. Okay. So that's why I'm just working on the coefficient matrix to do the work. Okay. So when we do all these algorithms, it's quite little steps, guys. You go from here to here, then from here to here, then here, and then you go next to the other slides, then you go from here to here, and then here to here. So when you go off that, so there, this is the matrix we started with. Notice we ended up coming with becoming the last matrix here. Now I am writing it in the row reduced echelon form. In other words, remember whatever is the pivot column. In the pivot column, the only element non-zero should be a one, the rest should be a bunch of zeros. So this is a pivot column, second column is a pivot column, and the fourth column is a pivot column. And I don't care what's in the third because the third is basically the representing non-pivot columns. And we know that how many pivot columns we have, that many basic variables we will have. And also, if you recollect, that's the rank of that matrix A, the number of basic variables. So if I have three basic variables according to this um, matrix, which is x1, x2, x4, and one free variable, x3. So that's what that free variable presence tells us. And at the same time, theorem 2 is valid which is always going to be valid for a homogeneous equation. Keep that in mind. So there are always going to be infinite solutions for this given homogeneous equation. Infinite means lots and lots. So I need to know what is this vector x, which gives me that infinite solutions. And that takes us back to writing the parametric vector description of the solution set of the homogeneous equation ax equals zero. Now once again, I'm going to do the whole process. Now a is this the row reduced uh, matrix multiplied to the vector x. Now x1, x2, x3, x4, remember these are the variables. And when you write down the this one is the corresponding linear system of this homogeneous equation. Now this, remember guys, gives me the parametric description of the solution set. What I'm looking is the parametric vector because I need to know the vector x. I need to know the whole vector x. I need to know this whole vector x. Now once we have got this parametric description, Remember, if you want to find this vector x, we always write the basic variables, which are x1, x2, x4, in terms of the free variables. That's how we do it. Okay, so when we do the math, what do we get? This is the vector x, x1, x2, x3, x4. Now remember, by default, x4 was 0. Notice over here. So this x4 is 0, and x3 is a free variable. And we write x1 and x2 in terms of the free variable. So what you get is x3 times a vector. So basically, your vector x is all possible linear combinations of the vector 3, minus 2, 1, and 0, which I'm simply writing as v. So that's the x is this. So it's all possible linear combinations of this vector v, which are the ones which are mapped onto the zero vector by that matrix transformation. Okay guys, now it's time to practice some questions from the book. So here are the bunch of questions. 1 to 6. Yes, yeah, sorry. It's 1 to 6, 9, 11 to 12. Thank you.